In this lecture, I'm going to describe the histological structure of arteries that carry blood away from the heart to the tissues, veins that return that blood back to the heart, and the structure of capillaries where really all the work's done, where all the exchange occurs from the blood to the interstitial compartment surrounding cells, and then from that compartment exchanging waste products and other substances back into the venous system, the venous components of the capillary beds to then circulate those products elsewhere in the body. And finally, I'll touch on lymph vessels. But I will also talk about lymph vessels when we look at the lymphoid tissues in a later lecture. Well, hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll have a good understanding of how an artery is structured and how a vein is structured. It's important you distinguish between elastic arteries and muscular arteries and be able to identify the difference between small arteries, arterioles and also capillaries. It's important to understand what the function of elastic arteries are and what the functional role of smooth muscle is in the wall of arteries and also veins. You need to identify veins, large and small, and be able to tell the difference between a vein and an artery. And finally, I'm going to point out the structure of a lymphatic vessel. But as I said, that will be dealt in more detail when I talk about the lymphoid tissues in another lecture. Well, when we have a look at an artery or a vein, we need to understand something about the pressure within those vessels. On the right hand side of this slide, you can see a diagram illustrating the mean pressure within these vessels as they pass from the aorta and then down to a capillary bed, then into small venules, and then into veins to be returned to the heart. And when the heart pumps, the pressure is called the systolic pressure, and it averages around 120 millimetres of mercury. And then when the heart goes through a resting phase or a filling phase, pressure drops in these vessels down to about 80, and that's called the diastolic pressure. And that changes the pressure within the arteries and as you see down the bottom, there is a section of arteries at various classifications, ranging from the aorta, arteries, arterioles, etc., to the capillary beds. And what I want you to notice is that the aorta has a very thin wall relative to the size of its lumen. And I'll explain why that occurs, or why that is, later on in the lecture. But then the arteries and small arterioles have a thick wall and they're circular in profile. That's because they're withstanding or at least they have high pressure inside them as they pass blood down to all the tissues in the organs of the body. And once the blood then gets into the capillary bed and beyond, the pressure is very low. So one way in which you can tell the difference between an artery and a vein, or small veins, is that bear in mind the pressure difference. Because an artery is acting under a fairly high pressure, the lumen is going to be usually nice and circular. As you see here in the image, here is a section through the artery. It's got a nice circular profile because the pressure of the blood inside it passing down through the tissues. If you look at a vein, however, right next to it, the lumens collapse down because it's acting under very low pressure and only opens up and transmits the blood forward when it's needed to, to return it back to the heart. Sometimes veins are mere storage un units, storing blood, and then it's returned that blood intermittently back to the heart. But because their pressure is very low, they're normally collapsed. In the diagram, have a look at the luminal aspect of a vein. 
And usually the lumen is larger relative to the wall of its lining. And the difference, the, the actual ratio, or rather the, the comparison between the relative thickness of the wall of the aorta or, a, or an artery compared to the lumen is a lot thicker. In a vein, the relative thickness of the wall of the vein relative to the size of the lumen of the, of the uh, tube is a lot smaller. In this section, there is also a section through a nerve fascicle. This section is taken through perhaps part of the limb of the body. And you're looking at a fairly large artery, a fairly large vein, and a nerve bundle. Those of you who do anatomy will understand that usually when you're passing down through the limbs, arteries, veins, and nerve bundles accompany each other, surrounded by connective tissue, which is a green-coloured staining components you see in this section. That happens to be collagen. So let's look now at the layer of a typical artery and a vein. Here, it's easy to describe the wall of an artery because some of the components of the wall are a little bit more obvious than you see in a thinner wall of a vein. On the right-hand side is a diagram that you can use to then try and work out or make sure you can consolidate your understanding of the wall of a typical blood vessel. But let's have a look at the section of the artery on the left-hand side. It's stained to show a number of different components that I will point out. On the top left-hand side of the section is the lumen of the blood vessel. You can only see a very tiny bit of clear part of this lumen. Well, the layer of the blood vessel closest to the lumen is called the tunica intima. Tunica just means a layer or a coat. Intima, it's the most intimate layer in relation to the lumen of the blood vessel. The middle layer is called the tunica media. The tunica media has a little star next to it or an asterisk. And that is to remind you that this is the coat, this is the layer of the artery that changes significantly. And it changes because of the different roles that this coat has in cardiovascular function. This layer is contractile. It can change dimensions. And that's very important, particularly in arteries, because you can distribute blood to various parts of the body by opening that wall or re relaxing that wall to increase the lumen diameter. If you get up and walk around or run, the blood vessels, the arteries going to your limbs, your lower limbs particularly, are going to open up so that you can perfuse your skeletal muscles with a lot more blood. So this tunic media can relax and therefore widen the lumen, allow more blood to flow through. Conversely, when you want to diverge blood away from certain parts of the body, then that layer can contract. Smaller lumen, and therefore less flow of blood. And that contraction and relaxation can be controlled by nerves of the autonomic nervous system or other factors that, again, we'll talk about in later lectures. So it's a very, very important layer. On the outside, the third layer is the tunica adventitia. It's connective tissue. Here it's fairly dense connective tissue, mostly collagen. That's an important layer for a number of reasons. Most importantly, it strengthens the wall of the artery. So under very high blood pressure, the artery doesn't rupture. It also blends the artery with surrounding tissues. So often the junction between what we'd call the tunica adventitia and surrounding connective tissue is often hard to find and really not necessary. Think back at the slide previously where I explained the neurovascular bundle, the artery, 
the vein and the nerve wrapped up by connective tissue in a component of perhaps a limb. It's very hard there to distinguish where the tunica adventitia ends and where the connective tissue wrapping around the artery vein and nerve begins. Now, often inside large arteries in particular, there is a little layer of elastic tissue called the internal elastic lamina. If you look carefully at this slide, you can see this little wiggly line, clear wiggly line running through. That's the internal elastic lamina. On the outside, there is also an external elastic lamina that separates the tunica media from the tunica adventitia. And if you look very carefully in the tunica adventitia, you can make out some little pink dots. They represent elastic tissue. You can't see them very clearly, but there is elastic tissue through most arteries. In one artery in particular, the aorta, that elastic tissue dominates for a reason I'll explain later on. Now this is a good stain to show you the components of an artery and similarly a vein because it shows you smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is the brownish component you see making up the wall of the tunica media. And the other stain, the greeny coloured stain, is the collagen. So the important thing to understand here is that the tunica media is made up of a combination of smooth muscle and collagen. There is also elastic tissue there, but in minimal amounts. And all these three components help to be, enable the blood vessel wall to relax or contract because of the presence of smooth muscle that I explained earlier. But the collagen strengthens the blood vessel as well so it doesn't rupture. And the elastic tissue allows some aspect of recoil or stretching. But this stain's a good one to show that. One important point to understand is that some of you may recall or remember from your previous studies of connective tissue, for instance, that fibroblasts lay down collagen and elastic tissue. Well, in the case of an artery and a vein, those connective tissue components, collagen and elastic tissue, is actually made by the smooth muscle cell. And as we look at other lectures later on in this histology course, you'll realise that lots of other cells too make collagen fibres and elastic fibres. But here, importantly, it's the smooth muscle that has that job. Well, now let's look at a large artery such as one that I just described on the left-hand side and look at a small artery shown here on the right-hand side. All that really happens is that the layers just get thinner. You start to lose layers of smooth muscle. Here on the right-hand side, the small artery has an endothelial lining. You can see the nuclei of the endothelial cells. Remember endothelium is the internal lining right throughout the cardiovascular system. It's a very thin epithelial lining, simple squamous epithelium, but we call it endothelium, or we call the individual cells endothelial cells. Smooth muscle is also in the tunica media, and there's only perhaps four or five layers of smooth muscle in the small artery. And look very carefully at the nuclei of this smooth muscle. Sometimes you can see them appearing like a corkscrew, a helical pattern. That's because of the way in which smooth muscle contracts. It tends to twist during its contraction. And that's an indication of the way in which the contractile filaments are arranged, unlike skeletal muscle. And then it's very hard, of course, in this section, in this small artery, to then distinguish components of the tunica adventitia and where the surrounding connective tissue begins. So essentially the layers get, just get smaller, particularly the layers of the media, the layers of the smooth muscle, when you go from a large artery to a smaller one. Well, what about comparing a large artery with a large vein? 
on the left hand side is our normal section of our large archery. Just have a look at it again and make sure you can pick out the tunica media, the tunica adventitia and the tunica intima. Recall again what is stained smooth muscle and what is stained collagen. But then have a look on the right hand side. It's a large vein and the difference is the layers of smooth muscle, the layer of the media is very thin for the same size vessel. And that's why earlier I explained that when you look at the relative thickness of the wall of the vein, relative to the lumen size, it's a lot smaller than if you compare the thickness of an artery with the dimensions of its lumen. And again, the adventitia is dominated by collagen. And again, you really can't see where it blends with the surrounding tissue, although this is a high magnification. So when you compare an artery with a vein, the artery is going to have thick wall, particularly the tunica media. It's going to have a circular profile because of the pressure inside it. The corresponding vein is going to have a much thinner wall and also going to be more collapsed because it's working under a, an internal very low blood pressure. What about then looking at a small artery and what we call a little arteriole? On the left hand side is a small artery, similar to the one you saw previously. And on the right hand side is a very small artery we call an arteriole. An arteriole we term when it's only got one or two layers of smooth muscle around it. Here, in this section, you can see a repeat of those small little arteries we call an arteriole. They're very, very small you're looking here at a very high magnification. But still, you can point out the nuclei bulging of the endothelial cell, the endothelium. You can even make out a very small component wiggly line there, which is the internal elastic lamina. But notice there are only one or two layers of smooth muscle around each of these vessels. And then you really can't see components of the adventitia on the outside. It just blends in with surrounding connective tissue. But I want to mention the pericyte. On the right hand side, you can see a little tiny vessel. This little tiny vessel is surrounded by an endothelium. Remember the endothelium is the lining of the capillary. If I just take away the label, have a look at this tiny little vessel. Try and pick out a nucleus that will be the endothelial cell nucleus. I know this is very hard, and it is very hard. But just on the outside of this very, very small vessel, it's a little capillary actually, is another nucleus we call the nucleus of the pericyte. This pericyte is very important. It wraps around very small vessels, particularly capillaries, and it has a number of functions. You know, during my early research career, I used to study pericytes and the function they had because at that stage they were thought to inhibit the growth of capillaries and therefore maintain a certain proportion of a tissue that's occupied by the blood circulation. And one of the big problems with cancers is that once the cancer cells spread and get into other organs, they attract a blood supply and therefore more and more blood vessels grow into the tumour and therefore the surrounding healthy tissue is starved and dies. Well, my interest was on these pericyte cells because they were said to be inhibitory to maintain low growth of blood capillaries. And I thought if you could actually try to get those pericytes to stop blood vessel growth in tumours, then you'd be able to limit the growth of the tumour and the blood flow through them. And that's led on to further research in trying to control what we call angiogenesis, the generation of new blood vessels, particularly in relation to controlling tumour growth and spreading of cancers. Well, these pericytes also have other functions. 
they're said to be able to divide and actually turn into maybe smooth muscle cells or adventitial cells, again, in situations where the capillary bed may be expanding and growing further. They're actually surrounded by the external lamina of the endothelial cell, or a term that we call the basal lamina, because these are in fact endothelium. And because the pericyte is surrounded by the basal lamina of the endothelium or shares the basal lamina of the endothelium, it's actually not a connective tissue cell. Sometimes we often refer to pericytes as being a connective tissue cell. But because they are separated from the connective tissue elements by this basal lamina, it means that they're really epithelial. I'm sure in the future, these pericytes will be assigned a lot more functions and a lot more importance. Well, let's have a look at the structure of a vein, a small artery and a small venule and a post-capillary venule. On the bottom left-hand side of the image, the section on the left-hand side, and on the bottom of the left-hand side of the image on the right-hand side, is a section through a small artery. It's nice and circular. It's got a thick wall of smooth muscle. But have a look at the vessel on the left-hand image on the top right. Large lumen, much thinner wall. That's a small vein. On the right-hand section, down the bottom, again, large lumen, relatively small wall. That again is a small vein. So that's how you can tell the difference between a small artery and a small vein closely next to each other or in the tissue. And again, look at the dimensions, the relative thickness of the walls of these two vessels relative to the lumen diameter. Up on top of the image on the right-hand side is a large lumen or space. You can actually see blood cells within this lumen and a very, very, very thin wall. This is a very small venule. It's called a post-capillary venule. Often small venules and post-capillary venules are very different or very difficult, rather, to distinguish. But these very small venules are the end part of the capillary bed. They're receiving blood that's gone through all the capillary beds and that blood is accumulating in these venules and then they'll finally move on to be larger venules and larger veins as they move towards the heart. So make sure you can understand how to distinguish the structures between a small artery, a small vein or venule, and then also the post-capillary venules. I think if you look at the right-hand image again and down the bottom, that small structure with a very thin wall is probably a small venule, whereas above is a post-capillary venule. But really the distinction isn't that critical. It's just to make sure you have an understanding that blood flows down through an artery, goes into a capillary bed, which have very, very thin walls to allow diffusion, and we'll talk about those in a moment, and then that blood passes into small veins, smaller venules, and then post-capillary venules, and finally back into larger veins and back into the cardiovascular system to return that blood back to the heart. Let's look at the aorta and the vena cava. They are very special blood vessels. Here's a section of the aorta. On the left-hand side, it's sectioned and it has been stained with normal hemato hematoxin and eosin. On the right-hand side, it's a bit collapsed, but that happened during the processing. And the tunica media has been stained for elastic tissue. You can see then that the dominant fibre in the tunica media of the aorta is elastic tissue. It has a very, very important function. Here is a higher magnification picture of this elastic tissue, and you can see the dark stained plates of elastica 
And if you look very, very carefully in that elastica, you can see that there are fenestry or small little gaps or pores between the elastic tissue, the sheets of elastic, which are branching. That's important because it's important to understand that a blood vessel gets its nutrition directly from the lumen or in some cases very large vessels get their nutrition from vessels we call vasa visora, vessels that come from the lumen or other vessels and they penetrate the tunica adventitia and they run along the junction between the tunica media and the tunica adventitia and they supply the wall of the blood vessel. So these fenestrations are important because it allows the diffusion of nutrients, oxygen, etc., to go through the depths of the wall of the blood vessel. Blood vessels don't have a direct blood supply or capillary bed going into them. Now, the role of this elastic in the aorta is very, very important. When the heart pumps, when the ventricle contracts, the left ventricle contracts and passes blood up into the aorta, the aorta expands as it accepts that stroke volume of blood, 100 mils or so. It expands because of the elasticity. That elastic tissue expands just like a rubber band stretching. And then when the heart goes through the resting or filling phase, when the ventricle is stopped contracting and is filling again as it receives blood coming from the left atrium, the elastic tissue inside the aorta then recoils, just like an elastic band contracting back to its normal shape after you've stretched it. And that recoil is very, very important because what that does is it maintains pressure inside the aorta during the resting phase of the left ventricle. And because it maintains pressure during that resting phase or filling phase, it maintains the flow of blood. Now, as you get older, that elastic tissue starts to disintegrate or not so, be not so elastic, similar to the elastic tissue in the dermis of skin. When you look at the dermis of skin, you often see just very dense collagenous connective tissue, and that's how the dermis is described. But it does have elastic tissue there as well. And like the aorta, the elastic tissue in your skin degenerates with age as well, so your skin becomes wrinkly. In the case of the aorta, when that elastic tissue loses a lot of its recoil ability, then it can create cardiovascular problems in the aged. So that's the importance of that elastic tissue in the aorta. Now here's a large vein, the vena cava. You know it's a vein because look at the image on the left hand side. It's got a large lumen but the wall's cl collapsed. Look at the thickness of the wall relative to the lumen. Totally different to what you see in a large artery. Now look very carefully on the right hand side because this is a section through the wall of the vena cava. The tunica media shown here is very thin. The tunica adventitia has smooth muscle in it running longitudinal along the length of the vena cava. That's an unusual situation. You don't have smooth muscle in blood vessels, in the tunica adventitia. But here you've got it in the vena cava. And the reason for that is because the vena cava are so important returning blood to the heart, to the right side of the heart. And that smooth muscle in the tunica adventitia helps the blood vessel, helps the vena cava elongate or shorten depending on the postural position of the individual because the vena cavas lie up against the posterior wall of the body. So that's a very important feature of the vena cava to have the ability to elongate and shorten when we bend or change our posture. It's a characteristic feature of the vena cava.